If you have your Bibles tonight, I'm going to just ask you to open right up to uh, John chapter 17. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a, um, <clears throat> is it blue? Red? <laughs> Should be a red Bible uh, in in the seat in front of you. Please pull that out, and uh, and if you need help, somebody around you, uh, look around, see if somebody needs help finding John. Uh, but it's in the about the last one third of the Bible. Um, you come to the New Testament and you see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you get to Acts, you've gone too far. And so John chapter seventeen, seventeen is the big number there, and then starting in verse one. And as we come together on this Good Friday service, I, I want to realize that today is what I consider the second most significant day in history, only to be seconded by Sunday, by what we're going to find out in, in a couple more days. Amen. Outside of this Sunday, this day goes down as a significant day, but it goes down as the single most horrific day in history. The darkest of day, the day that is even darker than the day of the original fall and original sin in the Garden of Eden, because this is the day that Jesus died, uh, not just for Adam's sin and not just for Eve's sin, but for all of our sins. And so today is a day that might be a solemn reminder of that gift that has been given, but it is also the promise of the gift that we have been given by Jesus Christ, a gift of his one and his only son, a gift that would lend itself um, to be accepted and a, day, and a gift that we can receive and trust in today. And so if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to just look at John 17. And we're going to look at a lot of text today. And I'm going to just tell you right up front, I'm not going to read it all. <laughs> uh, because we're going to cover three chapters of John tonight. And then we're going to cover the fourth chapter on Sunday. And so if you want to know how it works out, you've got to show up Sunday. Okay? <laughs> But, um, but it's an amazing text. I've, I've never preached this much text before. I've never even looked at this much text before in one single sitting. And I was so excited and so touched by the beauty of this message um, that I just felt like we had to do it a little different this year. And so starting in chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, we see Jesus pray. Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven and said, Father... The hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you gave him authority over all flesh, so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father... Glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. <laughs> uh, let's pray one more time. Father, I just pray and ask the blessing upon the reading of the word tonight. And pray, Lord, that you would just touch our hearts. Open our minds and open our spirits, Lord. And let us recognize just a little bit of the awesome price that was paid. I don't even know that we can fully understand but I know, Father, that you can reveal to us that gift and that we can trust in you tonight. And so I pray it for your glory and honor. Amen. The first point today is that the desires of Jesus, and the first one is that God would be glorified. Now, <laughs> you probably got an outline when you came in. You notice that it's long, and we are going to fly through it. And so if you want to, you can follow along as I do that. Um, but please do keep your Bible open so that we can, we can continue on. Starting in verse 3, uh, Jesus um, wants to glorify the Father. Now, the title of my sermon tonight is The Plan and Its Price. Um, and the reason that that is, is because we see the desires of Jesus in chapter 17, and then we see what it cost him in chapters 18 and 19. It's an awesome cost. We see Jesus reveal himself to us, reveal his nature to us in the most impressive of ways. And then we see him pay that price for our sins. So often we call the, the um, Matthew version of Jesus' prayer, his model prayer, we call that the prayer of Jesus. But this is actually what is known as the Lord's Prayer. That's the model prayer. 
And so what we see is that the end of his time on earth, Jesus prays. And Jesus prays along the desire of the Father and the desire of his own heart. And so in verse 1, Jesus asks that the Son would and the Father be glorified, that God would receive the honor that he is due. You know what? Jesus didn't just come to earth just for you and I. And I know it makes for great songs and it makes for good stories, you know, and we tell people, you know, Jesus came to earth just for you. Jesus came to earth because God told him to. Because the Father told him to. By the will of the Father, God sent his Son, right? Do you know John 3.16? Do you know it? We'll try it in King James. Are you ready? All right, let's see if you can say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's exactly right. God loved us. God sent his son into the earth that we may not perish. And so God loves us. And Jesus is praying for the glory of God, the glory of the Father above all things, above all else. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't want us saved. Look at verse 3. Even though that Jesus prayed that this would be done for the glory of the Father, it doesn't change the fact that he wants us to be saved. And so verse 3 describes eternal life is to know God and the one whom he sent, Jesus Christ. But verse 2 tells us that Jesus is praying that eternal life would be given. And so the desire of Jesus is clear. For the glory of God may we be saved. For the glory of God, may the world never be the same again, and it has never been the same again. The third point there is that God's people would be protected, sanctified, and called. Going down all the way... um, I'm sorry. Going down all the way to verse 15, we read... And I am not praying that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. You know what? He wants us to be protected. He also wants us to be like him, made holy and set apart. And so in verse 17, we read, sanctify them by the truth. And the truth is his word, the word of God, the the scriptures. And then in verse 18, when we are like Jesus, then the disciples are sent just as we are sent. So Jesus wants us to follow in his footsteps. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to walk in the spirit. He wants us to be sanctified, set apart for the work of God, for the glory of the Father. It is a good life, but it is a life still in the world. It is a life that is still in the midst of everything that goes on, but we are not alone. Not alone ever. And then notice lastly in verse 26. So all the way down to verse 26. Well, I'm sorry. Starting in verse 21. Let me look at that first. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. And then verse 26. We go to the very end of the chapter. I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. The last point there is that we may be united and that through that unity we may demonstrate the love of God. Isn't that exactly what we should be about? to demonstrate the love of God to everybody that we meet, to demonstrate the love of God so that they would have an opportunity to be saved so that they could come to know the truth, so that they may experience eternal life. And you know what? The love of God sometimes stings a little bit. Sometimes it's tough love. Sometimes God tells us stuff that we don't want to hear, like you're a sinner and you need to repent. Um, But he always does it for our reconciliation so that we can be right with him, so that we may live eternally, so that we can turn to him, the savior of our sins, and be saved and redeemed for the glory of the Father. In fact, the Bible tells us, right? How will they know us? And they will know they are, we are Christians by our crosses. And they will know we are Christians by our buildings. And they will know we are Christians by our bumper stickers. Oh, if you have one on your car, take it off. Take it off. No. And they will know we are Christians by our what? By our love. That's exactly what God has called us to do. 
that they, that they will see our love for one another and for everyone and that they too will want to know what we have. They will want to know what is different about us, what makes us tick, why we can be joyous in the middle of a world that hates us. Jesus came for a purpose with a desire from the heart of God. And so today is not just a day of death. Today is a day of hope, a day of love, and a day of grace. It is the day that, that also came at an incredible price, though. And starting in chapter 18, we see the price that was paid. In chapter 18, starting in verse 1, we see the incredible example of Jesus in that he was betrayed and supported, but not swayed. And I just like that. He was betrayed, but not swayed. And so in chapter 18, we see that Jesus shows us who he is. And one of the things that Jesus does, right, is he tells them, even in chapter 17, that if you have seen him, you have seen the Father. Jesus is the perfect revelation and the perfect uh, reflection of the Father. And so there's a couple of things that happen here in this chapter. First off, we notice that Jesus is getting sold out, literally, right? For 30 pieces of silver, for the price of a low, uh, a low value slave, Jesus is being sold out to the religious leaders of the day by Judas. Judas takes a company of soldiers and some officials from the temple, and he comes to arrest Jesus as if Jesus was some sort of criminal or violent person. You know, what do you do when you're betrayed? How many of you it never phases you? Yeah, hardly. What does Jesus do? He never, never misses a beat. And so when they come and they question him, he doesn't resist. Jesus is never swayed from the, from the mission that the Father has given him. He is never deterred from the mission and the awesome calling that God has given him. He is betrayed, but he is not swayed. Jesus isn't going to deny his mission or his ministry, nor does he deny who he is when they ask him. In fact, in verse 5, Jesus answers them as he does in verse 7. Um, no, I'm sorry. He does answer them in verse 5 like he does seven other times in the book of John by explaining that he is the I am. And if you know those statements in the book of John, they're absolutely amazing of them. There's, there's actually eight, and I know it's common to say that there's seven because seven's such a cool number and we just like it. Um, but there's eight, and so this is the eighth one. And so here it is that, that he's standing there, and, and they ask him who he is, and he says, before Abraham was born, I am. And when he says that, they take a step back and they fall on the ground. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, he's claiming to be somebody special. In Greek, this is the ego emi. Uh, this is the I, I am statement. And so he's making a direct reference to the Old Testament God of Yahweh when Jesus, or when God says that he is the I am. Tell them I am sent you in Exodus. Jesus is saying the exact same thing here. And when he does, the power of God comes upon them and they can't even stand in his presence. And then they get up and they get ready to stone him. Isn't that ironic? I am he. And they can't handle it. But then what happens? Peter, who we know to be the betrayer, isn't ready to betray just yet, is he? Peter stands up and he draws that sword that Jesus asked him if he had a sword earlier. And he draws that sword and he lops off the ear of the high priest servant. And it falls to the ground. And Jesus does what? He picks it up and he heals him. And he heals him and he tells him to put his sword away. He had just talked to Peter. He had just talked to the disciples. He had told them that this war was coming. That this battle was going to come. And they're ready to fight for Jesus to the death. Jesus finally has some people that are ready to defend him. Ready to stand with him. Ready to go to him. All the way to the grave. And Jesus stops them because that's not why he came. He didn't come to start a revolution in the world. He came to win a spiritual victory. And so Jesus doesn't stop his mission when he's 
betrayed. Jesus doesn't stop his mission when everything seems to be going his way, when people want to fight for him. Do you see the difference? How often are we swayed when somebody either hates us or likes us? How often are we swayed when, when somebody is against us or somebody is rallying to our cause, even if they're a little off base? But Jesus knows what his desire is. He's just prayed for his desire. And nowhere in there was, I'm going to take this world by force yet. But the day will come. Jesus shows us what true leadership looks like. In verses 12 through 14, Notice that he is taken before the Jewish, pre, the Jewish officials in chapter 18. And that they bound him. They bind him. He, he allows them to bind him. Jesus, the one that can call down the legion of angels, the entire army of heavenly warriors. And I know we like to talk about the, the, the angels are these beautiful women that, you know, play harps and stuff. But that's not the picture of the Bible at all. In the Bible, the, the, the angels are always men. And they're always, uh, in this context, always warriors in the armor of God with flaming swords and ready to go to battle. And he can call down a legion of them to stand by his side and to destroy his enemies. And Jesus humbles himself. He humiliates himself and he yields to the authorities of the land so that he can accomplish the will of the Father and he allows himself to be bound. It is amazing the meekness of Jesus. The power under restraint and under the control of the Father if there's any greater example than this, I can't imagine it. And then we see that he is abandoned and failed by his followers and by religion. After that, we see that Jesus is abandoned and failed. First by Peter in verse 15. Now, I give Peter a little bit of grace here in the fact that he was ready to die just a second ago. But he's got to be all kinds of confused. Now, does that give him an excuse to deny the Lord? No, 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 no. But he denies him once, and then we look down to verses 25 through 27, and we see him deny him two more times. Three times Jesus is denied by Peter. Peter denies the Lord just as he's about to go to the cross. Like the last step before he goes to the cross, one of the last words that he would hear by any of his disciples, I don't know that man. How devastating is that? But you know, there's another failure going on here as well. Jesus is being questioned in chapter 18 by the high priest, isn't he? And by the servant of the high priest and by the religious council, the very people that are supposed to be speaking on behalf of God and taking people to God. The high priest is the very person, the only person that, that would have got to enter the Holy of Holies, the most inner place. The very person who was to speak for the people to God. The very person who was the chief follower of Yahweh, the formal name of God. He and those who were in the ruling religious council are falsely accusing him. You know, the Jews as a people were created to bring about the Messiah into the world, to bring Jesus into the world so that all men and women might be saved. And they have turned it into a religion. They have minimized it into something that served them instead of serving God. They have failed God miserably. And in doing so, they have denied Jesus and who he is. And then lastly, in our next subpoint, we see that even while surrounded by people, Jesus stands alone. And isn't that exactly what he said was going to happen in chapter 16 in our scripture reading today? He saw loneliness in the midst of the masses. You know, there is no charge against him that stands. We see him go before the trial. They present him over and over and over again to face charges. And one after another after another continues to find him innocent. And yet the people shout that they want who released? Give us Barabbas. We don't want him. Give us Barabbas. 
You know what, the, the pain of Good Friday starts in all of these betrayals that we've just seen. But, but the truth of the matter is, is this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you look at chapter 19 now, we'll see our last point. Jesus accomplished God's will through pain. And the first pain that we see here is physical and emotional. Look at chapter 19 with me. I'm going to just read that first verse here. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Let me continue. Then soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and clothed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they were slapping his face. Isn't that incredible? The first pains that we see are physical and emotional. In this next chapter, we see the continuation of the bogus trial and, and imprisonment of Jesus going through the night and into the next day. Starting in verse 1, Jesus is tortured. And first he is flogged or he's scourged. And if you can imagine what a scourge is, you've heard of like a cat of nine tails, right? And so imagine a, a wooden handle and on there are strips of rawhide. And at the end of the rawhide are butterfly shaped pieces of bone or metal in which uh, would, would stick to almost anything that they hit. And so they would say that the Roman centurions, as they would whip someone and scourge them, that they were skilled at it and that they could, that they could literally rip flesh from bones. And as they did it over and over and over, that it was so brutal and so horrific that often the people died before they ever made it to the crucifixion. The blood loss was just so amazing. On top of that, they put a, throne, a, thorn, a crown of thorns on his head. And if you can imagine what that must be like, the pain would have been unbearable at this point. Some people believe that the reenactments don't come near uh, to the pain that he actually would have suffered. And the fact, the, the fact is, uh, believing that, uh, that even after the scourging, that it is very possible that, that you could see his internal organs um, through his back. And then to add insult into injury, or insult to injury, they clothed him in purple, a sign of royalty, and they slapped his face. They called him King of the Jews. They spit on him, we know in the other Gospels. You know what? I've been picked on lots of times, but never anything even close to any, anything that I would admit in the presence of Jesus. And it gets worse. In verse 24, we see that he was stripped and even his clothes, even his underwear were taken. The humiliation, they humiliate him beyond comprehension. And yet, Jesus is still there by choice. He is there to accomplish what he prayed for in chapter 17. And the pain continues to complete the plan. In verse 6, we see that the people shout to crucify him, right? And we see the psychological pain, even though there's no grounds of charging him. In verse 10 and 11, we see that Jesus knows of his innocence and he knows of his power. But he also knows that God has placed him there and that the only reason that they can do what they are doing to him now is because the, God, the Father gave them that authority for a limited time so that he could fulfill the will of God and die for our sins. And then finally in verse 15, we read that the people shout that Jesus should be taken away. And I want you to look at that, that he should be crucified and that they have no king but Caesar. This has got to be one of the, the most ironic passages in all of Scripture. Here are these people that have just praised him just five days earlier on the triumphal entry. And they have said, save us, save us. God, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As long as he was going to be a military leader and he was going to overthrow the Romans, they were ready to follow him. But now as he goes to die for their sins, they say, not only do we not even want him, but we would rather stay under the, 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 the oppression of the Romans than have him as our king. If you remember... 
The Israelites were never supposed to have a king in the first place. No king but Jesus, right? And yet now it's no king but Caesar. They have totally sold out their religion. They have totally sold out their God. They have totally sold out Jesus. Imagine the pain of hearing that your people that you're dying for would rather have a pagan king and worship him as a god than, and stay in slavery than to worship the God of the universe who sent his son to die for you. The price that he paid is crazy. But that's not all. In verses 25 through 7, we jump forward a little bit and we see that it's also a relational pain. Here he is at the cross. And I want you to look at those verses just a little bit. And we see as it continues, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, and the wife of Clopas, uh, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And then he said to his disciple, here is your mother. Just as Jesus is about to die, he hands off his earthly mother to his friend John. You know what? Jesus and his earthly relationships are over, at least in this body. His time on earth is finished, and he's now um, fully understanding that he's right on the edge of death. In verse 30 in the beginning, I want you to look at that with me. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And so we see that the pain was also physical to the point of death. Jesus has already at this point been hung on the cross. He has had nails driven through his hands, his wrists specifically, through both of his feet. He has been stripped, he has been beaten, he has been berated, he's been tempted, he's been humiliated, broken, nailed, crowned, robed, mocked put between two common criminals, and here Jesus proclaims, it is finished. The work that God had him to do is now over. He has, he has accomplished what God has asked him to do, what the Father has asked him to do. Jesus is done. He has given up his life in order to destroy the barrier between, father, between the Father and in humanity in order that he might be that bridge. He is the perfect sacrifice Jesus was the lamb that was slain. And then lastly, his death was spiritual. Look at the last part of verse 30 there. It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. You know, I think it's a very fair thing to say that Jesus died in every way possible. You know, the other Gospels let us know that even the Father turned away from Jesus while he took our sins upon his shoulders as he hung upon the cross. And Jesus would cry out, right? Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani, or, or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even the Father turns his gaze away from Jesus because Jesus is now taken upon the sins of the world upon his shoulders. And now he feels the spiritual death um, for all of us. Jesus wasn't just the sacrificial lamb of the Old Testament. He was also the scapegoat. All of our sins were placed upon him. At least for that moment, he was separated from the Father. He was separated from all goodness. And I think the greatest pain is that. The greatest price ever paid was that. And so let's stop for just a moment and just think about that, if you don't mind. Jesus paid the price as a suffering servant, as a humble leader, and as an awesome God. The perfect sacrifice that only he could pay. But he did so for four reasons, didn't he? First, that people might be saved. Second, that he and we might bring God glory. 
Third, that people will be matured, protected, and become more and more like Jesus. And then lastly, in unity, the world may see our love and come to know Christ as their Savior as well. But you know what? It all starts with trusting in what Jesus has done for you upon the cross. You may have difficulty in life, and I hope you can see that, that your difficulty doesn't touch what Jesus went through for you. He relates. He understands. He loves you. You may not under, understand everything, but today, please understand that the price that was paid uh, was enormous, and it came at a very personal expense to the Father to accomplish His plan. And so the truth of the matter is, is you can receive that gift today. You may make Jesus your Lord. And you may live because Jesus has died. And you know what? In just a moment, we're going to have a time of reflection before we take the Lord's Supper. A time where, where you can respond to God or you can just pray or maybe you can just think about this. You don't have to sing. You don't have to stand. But let me just ask you, do you know what Jesus has done for you? Do you know what God desires of your life and what he has done to make that possible? Are you living according to this simple plan, these simple four things that God desires of you? Are you accomplishing those four things at least? And if not, would you like to? If you've not trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, then today is the day to do it. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That all of us are worthy of death, but that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were his enemies, God sent his son to die for us. <clears throat> so the Bible says that if you will turn from your sins and you will give your life to Jesus, believing that his death was sufficient for you and knowing that he rose again on the on from the grave on the third day just as it was foretold and we'll talk about that sunday all day Good. that you can be saved that you can give him your heart and that he will give you eternal life if you're a believer in jesus if you're not a believer if you've not really done that if you've never made a conscious decision to make that decision to give him your life, please do so before you leave today. Uh, during this time of invitation, you can come forward um, and, and you can just stand up where you're at and just come forward and talk to me or to Steve or one of our deacons and, and, and just let us share with you this very simple prayer and you can receive that gift. And it could be today that you are a believer, but maybe one of these four things you've missed the boat. Maybe you failed to give God glory. Maybe you've failed to truly experience eternal life. Maybe um, you're not living in the unity that he desires, and so you're not showing love the way that you should. Or maybe you're not maturing the way that God desires, but today there is hope. Jesus has paid the price. He loves you so much. And won't you let him restore you today to give you eternal life and to let you have the joy of your salvation? So whatever it is today, we're going to have just some, some music playing. Respond to God and let him love you today. He has paid the price so that you could live. Let us pray.